<clears throat> does a lot of field work, um, both wetland delineations and environmental corridors, uh, vegetation surveys. Uh, so I'm part of the team that does most of the field work. Um, and I'm going to get into um, what services we provide, um, how to request those services, and um, I also get into the delineation process, just how we go about researching, and then um, you know putting our file together. And we'll also have a field. Um, we'll be looking at a part of the Retzer property here, and go into how we would physically stake the environmental corridor on part of the Retzer property. So, so. Um, as I mentioned, we can do um, field delineations. Um, we can also review um, environmental quarter delineations that are con conducted by private consultants. And um, we even just do uh, strictly um, office reviews of mapping of the environmental corridors. It can be that simple, um, just desktop reviews, uh, looking at things we can um, that we have access to in the office. Next. So to make the request, um, it, it needs to come from a local government official. Um, and that needs to be on, on behalf of the private property owner or somebody representing them, like a realtor, um, their private consultant. But it needs to come from the unit of government. Uh, we need to keep them kind of in a loop. Um, we're responsible to them, and, and so they need to be part of the process. Um, I just go into um, <clears throat> who to request it. Um, Stephanie Hacker is our executive director. Um, she needs to see whatever requests come in, so she's familiar with what what's being asked of her staff. And just, you can direct it to her by email, that's fine, or even just a, a letter is okay too. Um, but just please copy me on whatever email you send. Uh, that's helpful. Um, and just uh, just please make a, give consideration to um, if a full donation is necessary on a property, in some cases, um, it's not necessary for us to eliminate the whole, let's say, 40 or 80 acres of property if they're just planning a garage on just a small part of the property. We can look at just that specific part of the property where they have a proposal and evaluate that corridor in that area. So, um, and then when the request does come in, um, it's very helpful if you can include a map that shows the property itself, and then if there's going to be just a particular area we need to look at, if you can outline that and make it very clear to us where we need to, to do our field work. Um, and please include contact information, property owners, um, realtors, surveyors, anybody who has an interest in that. Um, that way I'll notify everybody before we go out in the field. Um, they're welcome to attend. It can be, the property owner can be there, consultants, realtor, everybody can show up and kind of see how we do this. Um, and of course, provide a copy of the environmental quarter delineation report. If a consultant's done that, their wetland delineation report, include that as part of the request as well. Um, those are all helpful. Um, at this point, we're about well, six or seven weeks out on requests. And so if you make a request right, right now, we're getting to the point where we might not be able to do um, a delineation um, if the wetland delineation season ends, let's say, in late October. <laughs> um, if the environmental corridor is based on, on wetland, that'll obviously be a problem. Um, if it's just an upland environmental corridor, we can pretty much do that you know, any time of the year, if it's just strictly an upland forest, we could review that any time of the year. So, next. so the, the first question to kind of ask yourselves if you're wondering about 
what the environmental corridor mapping is for a particular property is um, <clears throat> to pull up. Um, this is on our website. That's the link right there, and you'll find this map, which shows all the uh, sewer service areas in the region. Um, this is going to be important because if it is in a sewer service area, the sewer service area plan mapping is going to be is going to define or be the baseline for the environmental quarter mapping. If it's outside of those sewer service areas, then you'll be looking at a different set of maps that I'll show here in a minute. So, um, so if you determine that it is in a sewer service area, um, all of our sewer service area plans are in are on our website. You have access to those plans uh, through that link. Um, it's set up by community. And um, so like in the case of, of Retzer here, um, Retzer is in close proximity to the city of Waukesha sewer service area plan. Um, so if you're looking at this site, that's what you pull up and uh, open up the the top document there is the important one. It's going to have the entire sewer service area for Waukesha. All the corridors will be mapped, primary, secondary, isolated, and um, kind of find out where your site is on there. But in addition to the original plan that shows the whole city of Waukesha, also pay attention to the amendments that come after that plan. Um, those amendments will cover just small parts of the sewer service area. And for that part of the area, the amendment's gonna, going to supersede what's in the original plan. So here's the <clears throat> sewer service area plan for um, the Retzer area. It's in yellow there. And so the the area that's shaded yellow, outlined in red, is the sewer service area for the city of Waukesha. Um, as you can see, the, the Retzer property is not within the sewer service area here. So um, the mapping here is, it's nice to know what they, what they mapped in that area, but the baseline for this, for this property is going to be the 2015 land use inventory corridors. It should be the next slide. Yeah. So, again, available on our website. Um, they just updated this this part of our website, and it has the the most recent environmental quarter mapping, um, the 2015 inventory. They're currently working on the 2020, and that's going to be ready. You know, year and a half. so yeah, year and a half, I guess. Um, but for now, the 2015 PEC mapping is what's going to be uh, the baseline for environmental corridors outside of sewer service areas. So like in the case of Retzer here. Um, <clears throat> so that question about whether or not it's in the sewer service area is important. And here's an example of, of why it's important. Um, this is a site that we were asked to review in Pewaukee. Um, it's in the sewer service area and um, and the property as you can see in that inventory of the corridors the entire thing was mapped as part of the primary environmental corridor. Um, but the sewer service area plan had a different mapping. So if we go to the next. So the mapping at, in the sewer service area plan, the intention there was they, they picked up the wetlands on the site. The north side of the site is, is all wetland. And over time, the south part of the site became wooded. And that's why they pulled it into the environmental corridor in the 2015 inventory. Um, but what's binding here for this with this property, which was proposed for industrial development, was the sewer service area plan mapping. Um, so if you go to the next slide. 
this was the final determination of where the corridor um, was determined to be. Um, so again, it, because the intention of the sewer service area plan was to incorporate the wetlands and any lowland resources out there, we picked up really just the wetlands and then an adjacent steep slope right next to the wetland was also picked up um, that was wooded. So, but because the intention on the plan wasn't to pick up any woodland, um, that was not, not part of the corridor in this case. Um, so Joel spoke about this a little bit, but um, this is an example of the um, 1975 corridor composite maps. Um, they, they went ahead and delineated in the whole seven county region um, all the resource based elements and they each had a point value that like Joel's slide showed. And this is how those areas were mapped. Um, this is for the Retzer property. And you have different like two letter codes that refer to um, the resources involved here like WT is wetland, WO is woodland, SL is steep slopes, um, those kind of things. And, and so I would recommend that anybody who's gonna do a wetland or corridor delineation that they get a copy of this map um, just so they you understand the kind of the, the intent of the corridor mapping at that time. Um, and so this is again the Retzer property and how the environmental corridor was mapped at that time. It was considered to be a primary corridor. Um, Nature Center sits right here. And um, this has changed since that time, but it's just, it's good to know kind of what the intent of the original mapping was and the resources they were looking at. Uh, there are some interesting things out here, like a scenic view um, down through here. Um, you can kind of see there's a, there's a branch of um, tributary to Brandy Brook that runs through here. That was kind of the main part of the corridor there. But um, there's also been some prairie restoration on the site that they picked up in the corridor at that time. So, um, I guess I would encourage consultants to contact me or Frank. Um, this is not available online at this point. It's a pretty big job to digitize all of those polygons and codes and everything. Um, so, but I, we can make copies for you, uh, no problem doing that. And I can also check for you, as Frank can as well, um, whether or not we've been to a site, if sewer pack's done any kind of delineations out there, um, that's, I can get copies of those for you too, so you just kind of know what we found out in the field um, when we were out there. So I guess during the process, I would just encourage you to contact me or Frank. Um, so other things that we look at, and you guys are probably aware of some of these things. Um, WDNR's Surface Water Data Viewer has a lot of information about intermittent and perennial streams. They map those. Um, wetlands, wetland indicators. There's all kinds of information there that can be helpful in identifying um, resources that are going to be important in determining you know, what the corridor boundary should look like. Um, it is somewhat limited, and so the next slide, um, Sewer Pack has publications um, where we have done watershed studies and um, where we look closely at waterways. Um, like in this case, we did a Pebble Creek watershed plan, and the Retzer property is in orange, and we also, in addition to the tributary to Brandy Brook here. Um, they also identified a, another waterway that comes onto the project area, another tributary to Brandy Brook that um, DNR does not identify on their mapping. So um, 
in this case, because it's in a plan that we've published, um, we would consider that to be a a waterway that should be that should receive a riparian buffer, um, and typically a 50, 50 foot setback from that waterway. So we also go to the county websites, um, and the next slide will show all the, all the uh, um, links to those websites. But they have information on, you know, floodplain, topography, um, all kinds of things. Waukesha County's site is very good. We go there quite a bit actually, and uh, there's a lot of good information there to be found. Um, I guess the one caution I would have is that in some cases those those websites don't always have the current information, especially related to environmental corridors. They might have been 2010. I noticed a couple counties had 2010 instead of 2015. So when it comes to environmental corridor mapping, I would say come to our site and look at look at that mapping. Um, there are all links to the sites. All right, so. Um, kind of some helpful information when you're out in the field delineating. Um, the woodland definition is a good one to kind of memorize and have in your hip pocket just because it's oftentimes we're delineating corridors that are following a woodland edge. Um, and so the definition that we have in our plans is a density of 17 trees per acre. Those trees need to be at least four inch diameter breast height. And the canopy of those trees needs to cover 50% of the, um, you know, the acre. So, um, <clears throat> and as Joel kind of got into about areas where trees have been lost um, due to MRL ash borer, um, if it's a mixed stand, we do not take it out of the corridor, even though the the density requirements may not be met and the, and the canopy requirement may not be met. We consider that to be temporary and it, it would eventually reforest and other trees will come in and, and take their place. So I would, be, I would caution you in removing an area like that from the corridor. Um, Joel also touched on conifer stands. Um, those are often in the corridor. Um, Retzer has a number of them here. Um, Southern Kettle Moraine has quite a few, of course. Um, and those qualify as woodlands and are included in the corridor, unless, like Joel said, it's they have a, uh, some documentation that shows that it's the intention is for tree harvest and they're managing it on a regular basis and that kind of thing. Otherwise, they typically stay in the corridor. Um, also, oak savannas, um, they don't technically meet the, the density requirement, um, and sometimes not even canopy requirement, but we do consider them to be under the prairie category, um, and they should be part of the corridor, um, oak savannas. Um, and we'll, we'll actually see some today that would be an example of that, where we don't meet the density, but we even though they might not have the grasses underneath them, grasses and forbs that are typically typical of oak savanna, as long as the trees are oaks, hickories, those kinds of things you see in those savannas, if those are intact, then we, we put it in the corridor. Um, this is an example of a site we had in Cedarburg. Um, so the they had some ash die off um, in an environmental corridor and some property owners took it upon themselves to go out there and, and cut those trees down, which caused problems with the homeowners association. <laughs> and they, so they called us and asked us to evaluate the site and said, Would it, you know, is this still part of the environmental corridor? It also has a natural designation. They asked if that still met the criteria for a natural area. So I went out and identified um, those yellow dots are all the ash trees that, that died. Um, 
and were cut down. And what I found was that it was it was dead ash that they had cut down. The logs were still there, <clears throat> and uh, the stumps were still there. I could see that it was it had been ash that was all cut. And um, <clears throat> but surrounding those those jazz trees, there were things like maples and oaks and ironwood and all kinds of other trees that you know over time again those will fill in um, and uh, so it's it maintains the, the PEC designation it maintains the natural area designation um, so <clears throat> so this gets into <clears throat> Uh, setbacks that should be used for riparian buffer um, and pretty self-explanatory um, you know intermittent streams 50 feet 75 feet for perennial streams um, 75 feet for lakes that kind of thing Lake Michigan um, initially it was a 200 foot setback um, if you have a steep bluff it was from the top of that bluff set back 200 feet um, or if it wasn't a bluff it was from the beach um, that they would set back 200 feet um, but that that's been revised somewhat <clears throat> over time and when they've done uh, bluff stabilization on the lake shore we've um, in some cases reduced that to 100 feet so um, these are things that may seem obvious, but before you do an environmental corridor delineation, it's, it's helpful to have uh, the wetland boundary flag if, if the wetland's going to determine where the corridor is. Um, being aware of where the, the floodplain is is sometimes helpful, even in cases where the floodplain kind of is close to another resource. We sometimes actually had it flagged in the field just so we know what should be followed if it's diving in and out of another resource. It's helpful to know where the, the floodplain is. Um, and also, if DNR has made navigability or high watermark determinations, that can be helpful in uh, defining um, riparian setbacks. Um, any questions with from consultants, you know, that when you've been asked to stake a quarter, please call us. Um, you can start with me, and I'll oftentimes go to Joel Lynn if, it, if it's something I need to talk to him about. But um, I would just say that it's usually helpful to contact us at least once before you go out in the field and, and uh, just you're clear on what the intent of the corridor is in that situation. Okay. Um, Again, field biologists, I'm sure this is not anything surprising, but um, it helps if you can have um, <clears throat> measuring tape, you know, just for measuring uh, the distance off the, uh, for riparian buffer off a, a waterway. Um, DVH tape, tree calipers for measuring something that's four inches and above can be helpful out in the field. We ask that environmental corridor is staked and tied with ribbons. So when we go out and review that, you know, we, it's, we can see it out in the field. Um, and documentation with a camera, of course. Um, we now carry a GPS, which is really helpful. Um, those kind of things can, can be helpful out in the field. So um, kind of the process when you get out in the field, um, I think it's helpful to be aware of the resources that make up the corridor. Um, and then if you find that areas have been cut um, or if wetlands been filled, um, if those resources are somehow affected, it's helpful to document what's happened, um, try to explain the reason for it. Um, and then we also do vegetation surveys on all of our field work. Um, that's also helpful. Um, let's say you have a client who wants to develop a property and they, they're talking about possible encroachment of the corridor. It's
it's nice if we can document what that habitat is like um, for the purposes of looking at it, where encroachment might occur and what's it gonna affect if it does occur. Uh, that's, that's helpful. And of course, any, any critical species that you might find out there, document those. It's, that's also helpful information. Um, <clears throat> okay, this gets into the actual, um, how we actually stake an environmental corridor out in the field. So, upland woodland situation. Um, we don't go to the trunk of the tree, we go out to the canopy drip line. The idea being that um, that that root mass should be protected from uh, from development, and that so going out to the the outer canopy drip line is is obviously helpful in that in that regard. So you're, you place your stakes basically, you know, at this point, even that even it's out in a in an ag field, that's okay. You can still be out in that field with your flags. Just get the canopy for the most part. Um, there are some instances where you have a, a tree that's kind of fallen over but still still alive. There's a box elder that's growing crooked. Um, we don't take that to an extreme. We don't include those kind of things if they're um, leaned over and, and that kind of thing. But for the most part, we try to pick up what we think is going to be where the, where the roots are going to be. Okay. Um, in this case, if we have a lowland resource um, and you have a slope adjacent to it, <clears throat> and this would, this would be in a sewer service area, um, wouldn't apply necessarily in a outside of a sewer service area, but the intention is to pick up that slope um, immediately adjacent or within 75 feet of that lowland resource. So even though that slope may not have anything more than um, may not have other resources associated with it. it may not meet the 10 points we still ask that it be picked up <clears throat> and that you put your stakes at the top of that slope um, so again to kind of protect that resource okay um, 12%. yeah 12 percent or greater yeah um, this, is an, this is an example of, <clears throat> it's kind of strange, but in Fontana they had this big quarry um, property and they wanted to develop the, the bottom of the quarry basically, they wanted to put condos in there. And they asked for our opinion on this property. We didn't field stake this, but they asked for our opinion because the environmental corridor did include um, a forested area up on top of that slope. And our recommendation in this case was that they stabilize the, cor the quarry slope there. Um, they planted it in the prairie, um, which is a good, good idea. And uh, so they stabilized it, planted it, and so it, it is now part of the environmental corridor. Um, even though there's an alone resource down there, the idea, idea being that if you protect the slope, you protect the resource above it. So. All right, so this gets into the report writing. Um, pretty simple, simple stuff here. Um, not that different from a wetland donation report. Um, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory. We can move past it. Usual stuff. So again, these are things that are really helpful to us. Um, if you take a vegetation survey, show where those plant communities are, identify any critical species, um, any kind of exceptional areas, ex exceptional habitat um, is helpful for us to know that when making decisions on a development proposal. Um, Um, so the process of a consultant of the uh, environmental corridor delineation, um, you should work through the unit of government, have them request a review of, of your work. Um, 
we'll um, review it in the office. Typically, we, we do like to go out in the field and just take a look at it and make sure that it's okay. Um, and we'll, we'll write a formal letter response, um, either concurring with it or disagreeing with it. Oftentimes, we'll actually meet with a consultant on the site and just kind of straighten out if we think we have an issue with something. So usually we write just a concurrence letter at that point because we've already kind of resolved the issues with the environmental corridor mapping. So, um, and then we consider the corridor delineations to be good for a period of five years. After that, it should be looked at again. So, any questions? Okay, um, so after lunch, the plan is to go out, hike out to part of the property here that we'll look at the environmental corridor, how it's mapped there, how we would delineate it today. Um, and uh, I'll put the next map up soon. So um, we're of course here. And uh, you can follow the yellow trail here, and that'll get you kind of the area that we're going to be looking at, which is in here. Uh, it's currently mapped, um, the environmental corridor is currently mapped as the green line here. So this is all corridor. Uh, this is not part of the corridor, but that's the area we're kind of going to be looking at um, based on the resources that are out there right now. So. I don't know if uh, ready for lunch. Or... Yeah. yeah. What time do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess like an hour for lunch. Um, we'll kind of hike out there at let's say quarter to one. Any other questions at all or? All right. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.